My entitled parents kidnapped me and held me hostage at their home after a major car accident. I-32F was in a major car accident in January of 2021. Ironically, I had been taking my boyfriend, 36M, to the ER because he had been bleeding ulcers and ended up getting admitted to the hospital that night. This was when they were still enforcing COVID rules, so I was booted out of the hospital at about 0300 in the morning. When I left, it was snowing and not thinking, hopped on the freeway, which wasn't a good idea. I was driving a lifted Jeep Cherokee with mud terrain tires. Not the best idea for snowstorm driving. Getting off the freeway to go home, my brakes locked up and I went into a light pole head first at about 60 miles per hour. My Jeep did not have airbags. That was dumb. Needless to say, my car was totaled and I had to be extracted from the car by the fire department. This whole time I had been blacking out and losing consciousness and I still get random flashes of it. I don't have all my memories from that night or several months after the accident. I got sent to the nearest trauma center, which was the same hospital I had just left. The nurses felt pretty bad for kicking me out. I ended up with a moderate to severe TBI, a traumatic brain injury, broken under my left eye, hairline fractures on my skull on the left side, bruising behind my ears and black eyes. I had also cut open the inside of my mouth, had multiple lacerations all over my face, I broke my driver's side window with my face, broke and bruised some ribs, had hairline fractures in my spine, broke my right wrist, my right knee, and my left foot, which required two surgeries, and I still need approximately three more. Needless to say, I was not doing great. I had recently gotten divorced the previous year and think that my entitled parents decided that my accident was my boyfriend's fault. I had to stay in the hospital for a total of 12 days, in which case the mild family drama exploded into a severe family inferno. As I got closer to being released, all I had wanted to do was to go home to my boyfriend and our kids. He had two previously, and I had one. My entitled mother, however, decided that wasn't what she wanted. On the phone, her and I sound almost identical. The whole time that I was in the hospital, she had been getting on the phone and impersonating me to my apartment complex management, even as going as far as calling the cops to get my boyfriend and his two kids removed from my apartment. They were not on my lease yet. My entitled mother also forged my signature on hospital paperwork and made up a story about how my boyfriend was abusive to me and got him banned from seeing me at the hospital. Again, forging my signature and writing a letter stating I didn't want to see him. This whole time, I was still suffering from the effects of my traumatic brain injury and was delirious from the combination of pain medications and brain fog from my head injury. Entitled mother even had the locks changed on my apartment without my consent. When I finally was released from the hospital, I was in a wheelchair because of my broken foot that had just had two plates and 10 screws surgically put in to hold it together and an ankle to hip brace on my other leg from my knee being broken. I requested to go home to my apartment, but again, entitled mother played it that I couldn't go home because I had a second story apartment and couldn't take care of myself. So I got sent to stay at my parents' house, against my will, an hour away from home because entitled mother wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to let my boyfriend come back to my apartment. I spent almost a whole miserable month there. EM refused to take me home even after I got crutches and was able to bear some weight. Initially, they refused to even go get my crutches from town because they didn't want me to have more mobility. Eventually, it got to the point where I had a friend come and pick me up from EM's house so I could go home because they kept refusing to let me go. As I gained clarity in my mind and was taken off the intense pain medication, I was able to start rectifying the situations that my entitled mother made a huge mess of in my life, but I'm still trying to recover in some areas. I didn't find out until much later when medical bills started coming in that entitled mother had called my boyfriend's health insurance company impersonating me and had me removed from his insurance. It took months of calling and badgering and footwork on my part to get the situation figured out and have the insurance pay for what they were supposed to pay for. It almost caused me to go bankrupt. At the same time, my entitled mother signed me up for minimal health insurance coverage through the state and I had no idea I was enrolled in it until I got a bill later stating that I owed back fees. Needless to say, I eventually cut out both my entitled mother and my father out of my life after finding out how much they tried to control and how much they messed my life up. I ended up getting protection orders after they tried to break into my house, stalked me, and sent family and friends over to harass me. 
this whole incident was the straw that broke the camel's back. There was quite a bit of retaliation on their side that threw my life into a tailspin ever since, but I'm sticking to my guns and not backing down. Uh, moral of the story, make sure you have health insurance. Uh, second moral of the story, oh my god, this mother is horrible, like, just evil. Like, does she not have anything better to do? I feel like there's a little bit more backstory as to, like, the childhood situation because, like, what? This is crazy! Anyway, let's continue. Update. Wow, I'm a little overwhelmed with how fast this post exploded yesterday. I was definitely not expecting that. I tried to keep up with as many comments and replies as possible, but I figured this might be an easier way to answer the questions that have been thrown at me. But first off, I definitely understand those who are skeptical about my post. It's more than a little bizarre, and I'm probably not the best at describing some of the situations. But I seriously appreciate all the great advice that has been given, and I'm looking at some of the other options listed in the comments, as well as what I am already doing. I think the easiest part for me is to clear up the questions about the insurance and my entitled mother getting me off the insurance I had with my boyfriend and putting me on the state insurance without my or my boyfriend's consent. As an adult, I can call in and cancel my coverage at any time, with or without the policyholder's knowledge. There doesn't need to be a major life change in order to be taken off of a policy, usually just to get new insurance coverage or add someone to insurance. All my entitled mother needed was the insurance information and access to my information as well as his, which she did. She already had all of my personal information, including my social security number and my insurance information. This is how she signed me up for insurance coverage through the state as well. As some of you speculated, I'm sure it had something to do with the financial control she could exert over me as well as trying to totally get my boyfriend out of my life. But honestly, I will probably never get the real answers to that. The reason why I didn't get the hospital bills immediately is a pretty easy explanation. First off, my car insurance coverage included medical bill payments as well as up to a certain amount of money. At first, going through the billing process, the hospital, orthopedics, anesthesiologist, etc. had to send their bills through my car insurance first and then through my health insurance. I'm not 100% sure how that all works exactly, but I do know it was a mess and it took multiple tries to explain to all the doctors what was already paid out, who got what money, and the next insurance to the bill. As well as it took weeks for them and myself to realize that while I was in the hospital, the insurance I went in with got cancelled mid-hospital stay. So bills got sent out to the insurance I had with my boyfriend, which was followed by confusion from the hospital, insurance companies, and myself all trying to figure out when it is I got cut off and what was covered and what exactly happened. This takes time, it doesn't happen overnight. My entitled mother did tell me eventually what she had done with my insurance and how she changed it, but by that point, it was too late, and I was scrambling to try and rectify the situation and get as much covered from my hospital stay as possible. Even doing that, I still owe nearly 50000 in medical bills. For those who had questions about how I had gotten on his life insurance in the first place when he started the job, he had the insurance from which we had qualified as domestic partners because of how long we had been living together and how long the relationship has lasted. For everyone wondering if we went to the cops or are filing charges or anything along those lines, it's a very long story, but yes we are. I have a very good lawyer who actually represents myself and my boyfriend. It took me a while after I got home to my apartment to get to the point where I cut contact with my entitled mother. When I finally got home, I tried to start seeing my boyfriend again, and we started the long process of trying to heal from what happened since EM had essentially kicked him and his two kids out of the apartment in the middle of winter. They really had nowhere else to go. The kids ended up staying with my friends for a while, and he stayed in his car and rented out a hotel room when possible. I wasn't fully aware of what exactly was going on at the time, as Entitled Mother had my cell phone and access to my phone, and while I was at her home, she watched me like a hawk to make sure that I wasn't contacting him. If I did, I got berated, screamed at, and at one point did not have access to my phone, which was all very confusing because I was on very heavy-duty pain medication, as well as having the confusion from the TBI. After I had made it back to my apartment and started to have more contact with my boyfriend, my entitled mother escalated. Staying at my apartment even though I told her I was fine, showing up randomly, and eventually getting so angry that I refused to cut contact with my boyfriend that she threatened to kill him. That was when I grew a slight backbone and decided that it wasn't going to get any better. At that point, I filed for a protection as well as my boyfriend who copied my paperwork. 
When the first protection orders got dropped because we didn't have enough evidence, she had gotten a lawyer at this point, but we did not because we couldn't pay for a retainer, and this was before I had gotten smart enough to install cameras and a call recorder on my phone. My entitled mother went to the city's prosecutor's office and told them that she wanted to press charges of perjury against my boyfriend. This is where the friendship with the prosecutor started, and it was very hard for us to get anything to stick because Entitled Mother was getting in with our local police department and the prosecutor. Yes, they ended up going after my boyfriend and not me. Yes, that is selective prosecution, and yes, it is very illegal. At this same time, my mother and father are retired and apparently have nothing better to do with themselves, they had been in contact with my boyfriend's ex-wife, and at the same time, we were getting beaten down with the perjury case. They also helped my boyfriend's ex-wife start a custody battle for his children. They had been separated for some time, but the divorce had been stalled in court for several years at this point. They also filed in small claims court for a lawyer and court fees after our first protection order was removed. My ex-husband has been allowing my daughter to see both of my parents still, which I did fight and which has probably spurred the grandparents' right slash visitation case that they filed during the same time. So we have been fighting one thing at a time and collecting all of the evidence that we can. All of the hospital paperwork, especially those that were forged, had to be requested from the hospital. The phone calls to the insurance company needed to be requested and we needed our lawyer to get those. It wasn't something that they were just going to give us, unfortunately. At this point, we have wadded through almost all of the court filings my entitled mother has thrown at us and we are finishing gathering out evidence so we can counterattack at this point. At the time, our lawyer was telling us to be patient and gather as much as we could when we get through the thick of it and we can throw what we have into the system, but we needed and wanted slash want to have enough to nail them to the wall. From here, there will be counter lawsuits both jointly between myself and my boyfriend and separate lawsuits, as well as submitting what we have for the identity theft. It's a very long process and it takes a lot of time, effort, and money to get things moving. For those of you wondering if me and my boyfriend got back together and how that is going, yes, we did get back together. It didn't take long for me to start realizing what was happening when I wasn't being given the heavy narcotics and my brain started the healing process from the traumatic brain injury. It did take time for me to wad through everything that happened and try to recall memories. We did get back together, found a new place, and moved back in together with his two kids and my daughter. We have had some hard times, and of course, we are both a little damaged from the whole process, but we both have counseling and are doing well. I hope this helps explain and expands on the questions everyone has been asking in the comments. Oh boy, they don't want me to swear on these things, but I want to say so many bad things about that mother, like, oh my god! What a horrible person! Think of every pejorative possible and throw it at that woman. I hate her. I've never met her and I hate her. Oh my god. What a terrible lady. I hope everything works out. And then I hope they sue and win a lot of money and then never have to see the mother and father again. They suck. Next story. Story number two. My mom kidnapped our kids and said she didn't know it was against the rules. So my wife and I have two kids, a nearly three-year-old and an 18-month-old. We want to cruise to the Bahamas for two, meaning the kids couldn't go. So my mother volunteers to watch the kids. Great, it's all settled. We were going to get away for a week and have some time for ourselves. As the date approaches, mom starts talking about having the kids at her house for the week. We told her we were under the impression that she was going to be at our house. All the kids' stuff is here. Our home is a single story and easy to track the kids in. It's significantly closer to all of their doctors for emergencies. We're talking 20 minutes versus an hour and a half. And our house is baby-proofed, where hers is not. So we told her we really felt that they should be at our house, and if that didn't work for her, we would make other arrangements. She said our house was fine, but days later says she would like to be at her house because my siblings who still live with her could help watch the kids. These are the same siblings who we were told needed to be instructed on how to be nice to toddlers, which is why we weren't invited to Thanksgiving. No thanks. We'll get you support through our own channels, people you know and like who can pop in to get you relief and help out. So we leave for our trip, though as we are showing mom where everything is and going over food and snacks, she's more interested in playing with the kids than learning where the diapers are. So day one on the boat, my wife uses the boat's internet to do a video call to check on the kids. All seems fine, but my mother tells her not to call again for the rest of the trip because it may upset the children. My wife doesn't tell me about that part of their conversation right away, but as soon as she does, we call her back. 
When she answers, she's at her house with the kids, and you can see the brand new kids apparel and paraphernalia in the background. I asked her what happened, and she tells me she was really sick, and she thinks she got norovirus. What? Super nauseous, it was all she could do to call her brother, who lives five minutes from me to have him pick the kids in my wife's car and drive an hour and a half to her house. So, you were so sick that you couldn't watch the kids, but you could drive home in a car that wasn't yours and endanger kids that aren't yours in the event that you pass out or spontaneously start vomiting while on the freeway, potentially killing our children? Why didn't you call the list of people who said they'd come help? They had set aside parts of their weeks to come out and support with their time and money. Do they even know the kids aren't home? Do you know one person who is staying in a hotel to be 10 minutes from you in case of emergency? Now they're an hour and a half away from home and none the wiser from what's happening. The first thing she says is she was really sick. I never accused her of not being sick. I doubted it, but I never said it. Then she tells me how dare I judge her for her decisions and she doesn't have to justify herself to me and that she doesn't have to watch my kids. I told her to pack my kids up in the car and take them home. Someone else was going to watch them. When she dropped the kids off, she was nasty to their new caretakers and sulked. As soon as I knew the kids were safe, I sent her a message saying she clearly didn't respect us as parents. It doesn't matter how many kids she raised. These are ours and she sure as hell needed to justify herself and check in with us if she was too sick to do her job. We have the right to know what's going on with our kids and any sane person would call and ask us what we wanted them to do before packing the kids up and taking them away. If the roles were reversed, she would have absolutely lost her mind. And I know, because I've seen it. And that she didn't need to see the kids again if she was going to go that far out of her way to undermine us and then act like a spoiled child to family and friends when she gets caught. The next day, she replied to the message saying she didn't realize she did anything that was that far out of expected parameters. Yeah, her words. And that she recognized that parents had their own rules and she would have to learn ours. Never did anything resembling the word sorry come across in that message or any other. So we blocked her on social media and haven't spoken to her since. Wow, grandma slash mom, what's wrong with you? What's going on? Maybe she's like lonely or something? I don't know. Right? I'm glad, and I'm not even trying to flex here, I'm glad that my life has never gotten to the point crazy enough to where I was like, I should make a Reddit post because this is insane. Maybe one or two times, but nothing recently, so go home and hug your mom. Okay, next story. Story number three. Karen called the cops on my service dog and accused me of being too young to be disabled again. So, I saw the Karen with her child again, but this time in Walmart while I was grocery shopping. I made the mistake of ignoring my dog when she was alerting me to my heart rate. I genuinely thought she just wanted the sandwich I was eating. Boy, was I ever wrong. I ended up really dizzy and out of breath and had to sit down in the corner of the store while she was doing deep pressure therapy. I must have been on the floor for about 10 minutes. During that time, a staff member at Walmart came over to check on me and asked if I was alright. They gave me a free bottle of water as well and I am very appreciative of that. Anyways, while I was down, the same child saw me again from a distance and had another meltdown. The child's mom already explained to me last time that her daughter had autism. She was screaming and crying about my dog being there because she was terrified. I can understand why she may be scared because my dog is by no means small. She's a 115 pound female cane corso. Aside from alert and response, she's also trained for mobility assistance. Her breed isn't typically used as a service dog, but she was a natural. I got her as a pet dog and she became the service dog I needed. She's 100% a good girl. This woman did not leave the store with her child that was having a meltdown. Instead, she had the audacity to call 911 on me. Eventually, the cops did show up and she kept shouting that I was faking having a disability because I was too young to actually be disabled again, that it was illegal for me to have my service dog anywhere near food indoors, and that people like me are the reason why she had to suffer lockdowns. I'm Asian. She said the least I could do is be considerate and stay home away from everyone and keep my dog at home where it belongs. My dog was very clearly vested with tags that says service dog. I showed the cops my medical note that I carry stating that I required a service dog. In the end, the manager banned the woman from coming to the local Walmart for a year. The cops only gave her a warning for wasting their time and escorted her off the property. So I get it, like, the, the child's autistic, right? You know, she can't help it. But then the mother's like, you suck! 
Asian person, I hate you. You did the, the coronavirus. Like, what? Come on, lady. Come on. Like, you were somewhat valid, and then you had to be a jerk about it. So now, I, I no sympathy for me. I'll have sympathy for the daughter. And for the person making the post, well, she got banned for a year, so shop in peace. Or as peaceful as you can shop at Walmart. Okay, I'm done. Bye.